Dave. Welcome to Classic Bass Lines. In this video, I'll be taking a look at the bass line on the original recording of Footprints by Wayne Shorter. I'll talk about what makes this bass line cool, what we can learn from it, and later in the video, I'll play a slowed down version of the line for you. You can download the bass tab and transcription of this in the link in the description. And of course, if you want to see more content like this, please like or subscribe. So Footprints is one of those difficult and enigmatic jazz tunes that nevertheless attracts a lot of beginners because it seems like an easy tune. But to me, this can be one of the more challenging tunes to play well. The melody is simple and attractive and the song is just a blues, but the opportunities for rhythmic and harmonic complexity that are offered by the tune can be difficult to navigate. Now you see, I'm just a bassist, and Wayne Shorter tunes frighten and confuse me. But I decided to tackle this one because I had a student who was learning it, uh, which sort of spurred me to face my fears head on. I figured the best place to start was with the original recording. So this is from Wayne Shorter's 1967 album called Adam's Apple. The bassist on this is Reggie Workman. The tune is also often associated with Miles Davis and with Ron Carter on the bass. And I originally wanted to cover Ron's approach to this song in this video as well, but there's just too much going on there to fit it all into one video. So today I'll just focus on Reggie Workman's playing and I'll do the Ron Carter stuff down the road in another video. I'm just going to be analyzing Reggie Workman's playing on the first two choruses of the song, on the head in. During the solos, you'll have to improvise and feel out what's happening, but this is a good place to start for ideas on how to approach this tip. So this bass line starts. Which is great. I mean, this is one of the few really memorable ostinato bass lines in jazz. I think Wayne wrote this bass line as part of the composition. You don't really hear any recordings that don't use it. It's based on this rising C minor arpeggio, which is just... So that's root, fifth, octave, minor, third. And this just really captures that like smoky, late night jazz kind of feel. I mean, this would fit right in on the Twin Peaks soundtrack. So the first four bars of the tune are C minor, and it just plays that four times. Now, when you get to the four chord of the tune, the F minor, this is to me the best part of the bass line. This is what really makes the bass line happen for me. Because instead of just taking that same pattern and moving it to an F chord, He doesn't do that. What he does is he keeps the bass line almost exactly the same, but he just changes the only note that you would need to change to make it fit over an F minor chord. And that's just taking the G and turning that into an F. So it becomes... Which is just great, because almost the same bass line but because it's a different chord, the intervallic relationship completely changes. So instead of root fifth octave minor third, you have fifth root fifth minor seventh. And notice that by staying with the C in the bottom, we're creating a pedal point, which is where different chords change over a static bass note. And nothing gives the basses more power than a pedal point. So the first eight bars of this tune are fairly straightforward. We've got the C minor, the one chord. We've got the F minor, the four chord. Goes back to the one chord. Great. So far, so good. Just a minor blues, right? Now the turnaround on this tune is notoriously tricky, and it's a place where a lot of people get confused. If you want to investigate the changes here, I've got a couple links in the description. One is to a video of Peter Martin playing what sound to me like the accurate changes from this recording. And one is to a blog post where someone has gone through all the various printed charts of this tune and analyzed what changes were printed. He's taken in the fact that uh, 
Wayne Shorter even helped supply some of those changes to some of the real book manufacturers and stuff. It's, it's an interesting rabbit hole, and you should go down it if you want to know about this, Tim. I personally will not weigh in here. Uh, the changes in the video that Peter Martin does sound good to me, sound close enough. In my chart, all I wrote was F sharp half diminished, F7, E7, A7. Now that's because I understand those chords. Uh, they give me enough information to create a baseline with. All those alterations and extensions function a lot better when they're in higher registers. So I don't need to hit those notes on the bass. And if you look at Reggie Workman's note choice, he's primarily sticking to roots and octaves. He's creating interest in the line more rhythmically than melodically. Now, all that said, when it comes time to actually play this tune, the original changes don't matter. If you want to make an arrangement of this tune and create your own harmonization, you can do that. Or if you're playing the song, maybe it's just a duo, you could slip your own chords in on the fly. There's another link below in the description of Esperanza Spalding playing this tune duo with Wayne, and she plays her own changes in there and it sounds great. The important thing to realize is that if you're the bassist on a gig or a jam session, you're gonna to need to play whatever chords the other musicians are playing. The original chords are a good place to start, but make sure you use your ear to see if the other guys are playing something different because they might not know the original changes or they might be bored of them. If you stick to these because you know the right changes and the other guys are playing something different, it's gonna sound bad. Now, the last aspect of this bass line I wanna take a look at is the rhythmic stuff. First off, the tune is in 6-4. So that just means each bar has six beats and the beats are quarter notes. You could also think of it in 3-4, but I think 12 bars of 6-4 is just a little cleaner and reflects the sort of wide and spacious nature of this tune. It's a little roomier and less frantic than 24 bars of 3-4. Anyways, 6-4 is interesting because if you play dotted quarter notes, which is a very common rhythmic motif in jazz, one bar of 6-4 fits exactly four dotted quarter notes, which unlocks a lot of rhythmic and polyrhythmic potential. Reggie Workman only sort of hints at the places you could go with that, but Ron Carter takes those ideas and develops them quite a bit in his play. But Reggie plays interesting rhythmic ideas over each chord in the turnaround. I made an exercise that you can download below that's just the rhythms he plays over these turnaround chords but stripped of the notes and just written out so you can take them and loop them and experiment with that as ways to add interest to your 3-4 and 6-4 playing. So now I'll play a slowed down version of this bass line for you and afterwards I'll give you a couple tips on how I approach it.
Okay, so there's just a few things I want to talk about that will help you play this bass line well. Uh, the first thing I want to address is that you want to make sure your notes are nice and long. You want to have the notes be very legato, try to connect them to each other. So, so as long as you can make them, but still getting to your next note and not going over so both notes are ringing at the same time. Another thing I want to address is the position that I'm playing this in. Uh, traditionally, a lot of people will play this here. And that's a great position to play this in. That's probably where I would play this most of the time. I'm just playing it down here because uh, when I listen to what Reggie Workman's doing and when I hear these, he's sort of doing some slides from notes down here. But those slides, I'm not hearing them, I'm not hearing them go all the way up to that C, which makes me think he's sort of hitting down here, doing a little bit of a slide, and then starting back here. So I'm just playing it there because I think that sounds like where he's doing it to me, but you don't have to get all those variations and those slides in when you're playing it, so play it wherever you want. And the last thing is all those little variations, you don't have to play those. You don't have to, I just put, I just included all those slides just because I wanted to play along with him and I wanted to know exactly what he's doing. And you know, getting into those subtleties is a way to, you know, flavor our own playing. There's also a couple little variations that he does. The pickups when he's playing the F chord, sometimes it's, with an A flat, I feel like sometimes it was with an F, and I feel like sometimes it was with a G. So you don't have to play those. The main thing I would say is match up with whoever you're playing with. If there's a piano player doubling that line, you guys have to agree on those notes, especially because as you're doubling lines in lower registers, any clashes are going to really stick out and sound bad. So I think that's it. I hope this is helpful for you approaching this tune. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.